Good to have you with us at this hour. I'm Daniel Che for Arirang News. First, Japan approved middle school textbooks with stronger claims over Korea's Tokyo Island. Tokyo now raises hackles against this time in its annual diplomatic guide. In an attempt to settle the wage hike issue, several South Korean businessmen with factories at the Kaesong Industrial Complex are holding emergency meetings with the operating committee at the facility. Will this get Pyongyang talking? And Samsung Electronics is bouncing back from its 2014 third quarter earnings shock. Despite seasonal factors and slowing demand in the global market, profits continue to pick up for the tech giant. One day after approving middle school textbook with distorted historic facts, Japan makes fresh territorial claims to Tokyo Island, this time in its annual diplomatic paper. It's a move that will undoubtedly draw fury from the Korean government. Our Hwang Sung-hee starts us off. Seoul slammed Tokyo on Tuesday for repeating its claims over Korea's Tokyo Island, this time in its annual diplomatic guide. This comes a day after Japan approved a batch of new middle school textbooks with stronger claims over the group of islets. Despite the Japanese government's repeated nonsensical claims, Tokyo, Korea's sovereign territory, was the first to be sacrificed during the invasion of the Korean Peninsula by Imperial Japan. The so-called diplomatic blue paper, presented by Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida at a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, states Tokyo is clearly Japan's sovereign territory in terms of history and international law. The diplomatic paper will be published in English for the first time in nine years, raising concerns Tokyo is trying to take the issue to the international stage. Experts say that the combination of the paper and the revised textbooks could pose a serious problem in terms of history education around the globe. Textbooks play the role of passing down officially verified knowledge from the current generation to the future generation. But there are concerns that the social discord surrounding Tokyo is being maintained and intensified for future generations. Tokyo's unjustified claims over Tokyo, known as Takeshima in Japan, have been one of the thorniest issues between the two neighbors. As Japan steps up its territorial claims, experts say Korea must strengthen measures to oversee all events involving Tokyo. They also point out the need to set long-term policy goals to defend Korea's sovereignty over the group of islets. Hwang sang Arirang News. 17 South Korean business executives with factories at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex held a meeting in Kaesong in an attempt to make some progress on the standoff over wages. In February, Pyongyang declared a unilateral wage hike for North Korean workers at the complex. South Korea refused to give in to the demand, but the North has ignored repeated calls for bilateral consultations. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. Several South Korean executives from the Kaesong Industrial District Management Committee went into the complex in North Korea on Tuesday. They held an emergency meeting to discuss wages with officials from the North Central Special Development Guidance Bureau, which is in charge of running the zone. We explained to the North that realistically the companies are stuck in a harsh situation. Since inter-Korean tensions are high, the wage hike, which is not a big deal, is amplified. We strongly requested that North Korean officials talk to the management to promptly resolve the issue. They agreed to tell their higher-ups. The meeting comes as payday for North Korean workers approaches on April 10th. Pyongyang unilaterally demanded a pay raise of around 5 percent to 74 U.S. dollars a month for its workers in Kaesong, effective that date. The committee says it has a little bit of a grace period. Depending on the situation of the company, they have a grace period until the 20th of this month to pay their workers, so we do have some time left. Even with the grace period, if a compromise is not made by the 20th of April, South Korean companies may have to plan for the worst-case scenario, other complex closing down. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Paju. Prime Minister Lee Wan gu says the government will positively review salvaging the Seoul Ferry, which capsized and sank in waters off Korea's southwestern coast nearly a year ago. Meeting with reporters earlier today, he said he will take into account the opinions of the victims' families and the public when deciding on the ship's recovery. In a latest poll, more than 70 percent of Koreans said the ferry should be recovered to help investigate the accident that killed more than 300 people. On Monday, President Bakane said she will actively look into it after the process is found to be technically feasible.
The Prime Minister also said he hopes to meet with the families this week. Revisions to Korea's tax law came into effect last year and promptly upset many middle-income earners who say they ended up paying more than they had expected. Now, the government says it's working on a bill to issue rebates for the extra amounts those taxpayers had to fork out. But will it be enough to ensure fairer taxation? Our Shin Se-min reports. Korea's Ministry of Strategy and Finance says that overall, the revised tax law did not put an additional burden on taxpayers. Based on last year's tax returns on average, the tax burden on middle-income earners did not increase. 85 percent of those taxpayers either felt no change or a decrease in their tax burdens. But the ministry has admitted that for the rest of the 15 percent of middle-income earners were faced with a heavier tax burden following the revision. The revised tax code was expected to collect more from high-income earners, not from those with an annual income of little over 50,000 U.S. dollars. A bill that would issue rebates to 5.4 million Koreans in that group is still awaiting parliamentary approval later this month. The government has also pledged to improve the tax policy for middle-income earners. Changes include expanding the tax deduction for households with more than three children. But experts says more can be done. The rise in taxes for middle-income earners was greater than that of high-income earners. The government can achieve fairness by collecting more taxes from high-income earners. But the ministry needs to carry out the shift in policy in a more thorough manner. Hong added as the government aims to still make the policy more fair, changes need to be done. He added that the better transparency is critical in regaining the public's trust. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. In the tech realm, Samsung Electronics has posted profits that beat market expectations after a dip in earnings for six consecutive quarters. Growing appetite for memory chips and displays helped to counter the disconcerting slump in smartphone sales, a concern that led the South Korean tech giant to even freeze salaries this year. Now Samsung hopes to build traction with Friday's debut of its new Galaxy S6 models while maintaining its global grip on supplying chips and displays. The latest first quarter earnings report seems to be showing a light at the end of the tunnel. Our Song ji reports. Samsung Electronics' first quarter figures show the Korean tech giant did better in terms of quality than it did in quantity. Samsung generally fared better than expectations despite seasonal factors and slowing demand in the global market. Samsung's sale for the first three months of the year stood at 43 billion U.S. dollars, down 11 percent from last year. Profits were also down 30 percent during the same period, standing at $5.4 billion. While sales fell slightly short of market expectations, profits actually outstripped the market consensus, continuing its recovery, gaining 12 percent from the fourth quarter of last year. The smartphone maker's profitability also bounced back to double figures, settling at over 12.5 percent. While the guidance figure released on Tuesday does not break down performance by sector, market analysts assume Samsung generated $3 billion in profits from its semiconductor arm and $2 billion from its mobile sector. Actually, the Q1 you know, results uh, was, was quite impressive because the uh, market consensus was you know, 5.4 trillion won, but uh, their you know, OP was, OP results was you know, 5.9 trillion won. Because of the uh, Samsung Semi division, even though the, uh, uh, it's a slow you know, seasonality in Q1, they could uh, reduce the cost uh, so they could make the high OP in Q1 this year. With some analysts calling Samsung's first quarter figures an earnings surprise, their expectations that the second quarter profits could top 7 billion U.S. dollars, with its latest Galaxy S6 smartphone model set to go on global release on Friday. Song ji Arirang News. Korean car makers have seen a dramatic drop in automobile exports in the first quarter of this year. But the opposite can be said about recent domestic sales. According to data released by Korea's trade ministry on Tuesday, the total number of cars sent overseas stood at roughly 735,000, down 6.6 percent year on year. The ministry says the weekend and slow growth in emerging markets contributed to the sluggish performance. However, domestic sales of Korean and imported cars jumped by 8.8 percent in March alone to over 150,000 units. With an increase of 41 percent, imported cars sold especially well. 
On the political front, the National Assembly kicked off its month-long extraordinary session this Tuesday. It aims to resolve a variety of pending issues, including the much-debated pension plan reforms for public servants. Our National Assembly correspondent Park ji -won tells us more. Lawmakers are facing a full slate of issues during this session, from reforming debt-ridden pension plans for public servants and redistricting election constituencies to passing piled-up bills, for example, a bill that would make surveillance cameras at child care services mandatory. Out of these issues, follow-up measures for last April's ferry disaster that killed over 300 passengers, mostly students, will be one of the top agenda items, especially with the accident's one-year anniversary approaching next week. Upcoming by-elections, which will be held on the 29th of this month, will also fall during this session, increasing pressure on the main rival parties. Only four seats are up for grabs, but both parties consider the election significant as they reflect voter sentiment ahead of next year's general elections. Leaders from the main rival parties will deliver speeches to the assembly this week, and interpolation sessions will take place over four days next week. This month's long assembly will continue until early next month. Park ji -won, Arirang News. And also over at the assembly, a confirmation hearing for the nation's Supreme Court justice finally started 72 days after the assembly received the request for the approval of the nomination. 59-year-old nominee Park Sang-ok, a former prosecutor, has been under fire for his allegedly poor investigation of the 1987 torture and death of a student activist. Back then, prosecutors, including the nominee, concluded the case by charging two police officers who tortured the victim. But in just a few months, three more accomplices were revealed to have been a part of that crime. Opposition parties criticized Park for covering up the case under pressure from police. Park defended himself by saying his role was limited to assisting senior prosecutors. Military police and prosecutors have vowed to obliterate corruption and violence, including sexual assault in the military. This was the first time senior law enforcement officials under the Defense Ministry gathered to figure out a system that could enhance coordination among the investigative agencies. The meeting comes as bullying and sexual abuse in the military continues to make headlines, including the extreme case of the death of an army private after a severe beating by his comrades last year. Defense Minister Han min -gu called on senior officials to produce tangible outcomes within the year. The government laid out plans to promote the country's health and medical sector just in time to celebrate the World Health Day on April 7th. Our Kim ji yeon has more. Under the two-year plan unveiled Tuesday, the Ministry of Health and Welfare says it will strengthen cooperation with foreign governments for overseas expansion of more than 160 local medical institutions. The ministry has also set a 2017 goal of attracting more than 500,000 foreign patients to Korea each year, more than doubling the number of patients it targeted in 2013. The ministry also says it will promote research and development to facilitate the commercialization of its medical technology and devices. Other areas of focus include overseas patent application in the stem cell and regenerative sector and boosting medical and beauty product exports to nearly 29 billion U.S. dollars in sales within two years. There will be specific efforts to create an anti-aging industry business cluster in Korea in hopes of raising market volume to nearly $18.5 billion, up from $13 billion in 2013. The ministry says it plans to establish an open-source platform to incorporate big data in the health and medical sector. To do this, it's establishing solid legal ground and a management system to ensure the safe handling of personal information. Finally, the ministry plans to raise country competitiveness in clinical testing to rank among the world's top seven, up three notches from 2013. Kim Jung, Arirang News.
We've come to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. Do join us again 10 p.m. at Korea time for more.